Thanks for staying up late. Um, thanks especially to John Alexander, who first shared about the Society of Scientific Exploration with me at an X conference in Washington, D.C. some years ago and said, you might fit in better there at the SSE than here with the crazies. Uh, so thanks, John, for that. Um, and thanks for everybody for being here. Before I start, I'm curious by a show of hands, how many people in here watched or even heard of the citizens hearing on UFO disclosure that was held in Washington, D.C. in May 2013? So that's a little over a third of the room. How many people uh, have read or uh, attended to anything uh, Dr. Stephen Greer has ever said or done? Uh, okay. Uh, a different kind of group of people, an interesting overlap. Dr. Greer was one of the witnesses who came to the citizens' hearing and uh, testified under oath that he had been meeting with this Dr. Marin, and that will be the core of the tale, but it'll also be a little bit of my personal history. People ask me, how'd you get interested in UFOs? And I, and I thought about that, and it actually started when I was in high school. I, I was playing around with lasers and holograms. In 1973, 74, I built a laser out of a kit, uh, displayed a hologram at a science fair, and started winning all these awards from the Air Force, the Army, and one of the awards included a trip to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in 1974. I was in New Albany, Indiana, just a little north of Louisville, Kentucky. That's about two hours away up there. And this is their website from a couple of years ago for the uh, science fair program. They're still doing it, sending Air Force personnel out to look at what high school kids are doing uh, at science fairs. Anyone know what their um, mascot looks like for the Air Force's science fair program? Anybody involved in this at all? Here he is. <laughs> Wright-Patterson Air Force Educational Outreach Office. I wonder if he was flying the Wright Brothers uh, plane there. Uh, and their mission statement's kind of interesting. Our goal is to be the best one-stop resource for encouragement and enhancement of K through 12 science, math, and technology education throughout the Air Force, the world, and beyond. So uh, they, um, they apparently uh, have a sense of humor. When I uh, told a friend of mine in scouting, um, an, an adult advisor, just uh, he's about 10 years older than me is all, that I was headed up to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for this. He said to me in 1974, oh, be sure to ask the Air Force guys about the UFO in Hangar 18. So at the age of 16, I did. And that's another story I'll tell you later. Uh, and you'll see here that I did indeed get the, let's see if I can make the laser pointer work, the all expenses paid tour of the Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. I actually, I have no memories of anything exciting that happened on that trip, but I don't remember most of high school either. Uh, after that, I earned a, a BS in marketing at IU. I worked for an NBC affiliate, did a little freelance work for ESPN, went on to get an MBA in finance at Purdue, then back to IU for a PhD in mass comm. I uh, got a few NAB research grants, presented at a few conferences, including the American Psychological Association. So I had a fairly decent career in academe, published a book called Broadcast and Cable Selling, earned tenure as an associate professor of marketing. Resigned tenure. Anyone else in here resigned tenure? Really? We need to form a support group later or something. I'm, it's been 20 years, and I think I'm still in some sort of cognitive dissonance about it. I uh, was a pioneer in online um, uh, MBA programs. I started doing some work with the University of Chicago that created a kind of best of the best of an online MBA back in 1999 when we were still worried about the limitations of 56K dial-up modems for online education. That was a limiting factor back then. And then I got involved in, uh, uh, after I resigned tenure and considered myself uh, retired while my wife considered me unemployed, that kind of awkward transitional phase between retirement and unemployment, I started fooling around with politics. And in 2008, I ran for Congress as a libertarian. Uh, and uh, in the first district there in Utah, I called for congressional legislation to protect whistleblowers. We've been persecuting whistleblowers. The fourth estate's kind of complicit in that, I think. We've lost our role of any kind of watchdog on what our federal government is doing. And, um, uh, and then after passing legislation for uh, whistleblower protection, I was calling for congressional hearings on waste, fraud, criminal activity, and what the hell, the ET issue. So if there's military contractors out there, or guys who've signed secrecy oaths, let's get Congress to eliminate them and hold hearings on that too. If nothing else, it ought to result in some interesting TV ratings. And I did that not as a true believer in UFOs. I haven't had a sighting. 
I, I don't buy 90% of what's out there. I like John Alexander's book, though, if you want to catch up on the UFO issue. UFOs, myths, realities, and conspiracies. Did I get that in the right order? Realities, myths, conspiracies. Conspiracies, realities, myths. Conspiracies, myths, realities. UFOs, whatever it was, uh, John Alexander's book is fantastic. Uh, get it and read it and try to remember the title better than I do. Uh, I ran some radio ads. This was fun. Let's see if I can make it play. Eh, I clicked on it. It worked earlier when you were testing it. Oh, no, no. Donald we're halfway Rumsfeld in. testified that the Pentagon had lost. I'm Dr. Joe Bookman, candidate for the United States Congress. Over the last 20 years, the demo publicrats have spent money like they own the printing press. Run up an $11 trillion debt. Donald Rumsfeld testified that the Pentagon had lost $2.3 of those dollars. And Catherine Fitz testified that the HUD books were unauditable. It's time to end this cover-up of government waste, fraud, and more. I join with Governor Bill Richardson, former White House Chief of Staff John Podesta and others, and call on Congress to pass legislation protecting whistleblowers and requiring full disclosure not only of what they know about government waste and fraud, but also the disclosure of the extraterrestrial engagement of the people of the Earth. Send a message to Washington this year that you want full transparency and disclosure as well. Learn more at www.thedoctorwillfreeyounow.com. Thedoctorwillfreeyounow.com. Paid for by the Bookman for Congress Committee. I'm Dr. Joseph Geddes Bookman, and I approved this message. Yeah, if you're going to run for public office, well, thank you. That's cool. Standing ovation. That was amazing. Now, if you're going to run for public office, you might as well have some fun doing it. I'm fresh off the Libertarian Presidential Nominating Convention in Orlando, uh, which was a ton of fun. We had one of our candidates as a uh, subject of interest in a murder investigation in Belize, John McAfee, uh, was there. Uh, but we did manage on the second round to renominate uh, former New Mexico governor, uh, Gary Johnson, two-term Republican down there in the Democrat-dominated state of New Mexico. And then for B VP, a uh, former two-term Republican governor of Massachusetts, Bill Weld, who uh, Romney has said, hey, the Libertarians have done good nominating Weld. I look forward to getting to know Governor Johnson. So the Libertarians have kind of sold their soul to some liberty-leaning Republicans. Uh, and, you know, if Weld coughs up a lot of old Republican money, uh, we can make a run of it this year. But anyway, back in 2008, made it into the voter guide, hit the front page of my hometown newspaper, the Park Record in Park City, Utah, much to the dismay of my children who went to school later that day under the headline, Immigration, Taxes, and uh, Little Green Men. Candidate wants feds to reveal information about aliens. Joe Bookman's campaign for Congress will address the typical fare for a libertarian, immigration control, eliminating taxes, downsizing government. Then the political newcomer from Summit Park who's running as an outsider uh, might move to Little Green Men. Uh, so that was fun. And I, I did that on purpose. You know, if you're going to run as a third-party candidate, you need something to create a little viral interest and get people talking about you. Out of that, I got noticed by uh, Steve Bassett, who was running these X conferences in Washington, D.C. Did anyone else ever go to an X conference besides John and I? Any other X conference veterans? It's just the two of us, apparently. They were nuts, weren't they, John? John spoke there, though. What I remember of his presentation was he came out dressed as a men in black with the sunglasses, and at the end he, he blinky-thinged all of us to forget what he had said. But um, there I am on stage with a bunch of crazy people. Alfred Weber is right next to me. Michael Sal is there, and, and my personal favorite, uh, Paola Harris. But at any rate, some interesting folks were there, some highly credible, like Dr. Alexander, C.B. Scott Jones, uh, Ed Mitchell was there, Paul Hellyer. Uh, was there as well, and others. Um, out of those X conferences, uh, once the uh, Obama administration put up their um, We the People website, Steve Bassett, who's the guy behind the X conference, uh, got this petition up and it got 5,000 signatures, so the White House promised they'd respond, and they did. And they responded with a statement that the U.S. government has no evidence that any life exists outside our planet more than an extraterrestrial presence has contacted or engaged any member of the human race. Well, I question that. You know, I don't buy 90% of the, what occurs to me at least is hooey that's in this field. I also think it's not credible to say there's no evidence whatsoever. So Bassett started using that response as a cudgel and um, raising awareness around it and got a, um, 
multimillionaire in Canada who was going through a divorce and didn't want his ex-wife to get any money to give him a million one hundred thousand dollars to fund the citizens hearing on disclosure. It was in hard silver and so they planned to spend the million one and silver tanked. They wound up with about seven hundred thousand, spent eight hundred thousand pulling off the event, didn't have the final two to three hundred thousand they counted on to do the documentary based on the event, but we pulled off one, one hell of an event. Uh, it was one of the best weeks of my life. I loved it. Uh, Steve called me, though, about a month ahead of time. He had organized all the witnesses and the venue and spent all the money and forgot to invite any members of Congress. Uh, and um, said he was going to have to refund um, Clearwater's money. And I said, well, just give me 48 hours. In those 48 hours, I got um, Merrill Cook, who had served on the Science and Technology Committee, and Mike Gravel to agree to serve. And Steve had gotten Carolyn Kilpatrick, but she didn't want her name announced until she had a couple of other people. So when we got those three, then they announced the deal was on, we're going to go ahead with the program. And it made it a little easier to recruit other retired members of Congress who then knew who their colleagues would be. Nobody wanted to go first out of that group. And we wound up actually turning away a handful of people who, uh, who got in late. We uh, nailed it down with the uh, five here on the left, and then I found Roscoe Bartlett. Uh, amazing guy, um, had uh, something like 20 patents with NASA before he ran for Congress in his 60s, was in his 80s. Uh, his political action committee was the every truth be told political action committee. So we added a sixth member, which also bumped the budget a little bit out of control. Uh, the citizens hearing was held from April 29th to May 3rd, 2013. And uh, we had 43 witnesses from 10 different nations, five representatives, one former United States senator. It lasted five days. It was in the National Press Club main ballroom. It cost about $800,000 to pull it off. And we had 30 hours of testimony under oath, all recorded on high-def video. Uh, here are the witnesses. You'll recognize, of course, uh, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, Colonel French proved to be problematic. I could spend time on him if I had more time, but Kevin Randall pretty well dissected the Colonel's uh, testimony and found a lot of uh, fraud there. Um, Paul Hellyer's testimony also a little sketchy because he was reading from some books that he finds credible that, uh, that I would say uh, Colonel Alexander and I might question. I think John's written some critiques of Hellyer's testimony in other venues as well. These are some of the others, but the one I'll focus on tonight is Dr. Greer, who uh, you know, set a record, I think, for online fundraising for the Sirius movie. They raised more money to produce this document. How many people in here watch Sirius again? So, okay, maybe 20% of the room. Are you aware there's another movie now that he's raised a half a million dollars to produce called, um, called uh, oh heck, Undisclosed, I think, maybe? Something like that. Uh, at any rate, so the, the guy uh, the guy's very successful at uh, uh, managing the finances of this. Danny Sheehan was both a witness and of counsel to the committee, and uh, it was a heck of a time. Here's an email I found that I thought revealed some of what I was doing in recruiting these former members of Congress. The purpose here is not to convince former members of Congress, but to put them in the position of doing again the kind of job they were elected to do and did to challenge the witnesses, to test them in a refiner's fire, of a recreated congressional hearing and see how the evidence holds up. Will these 43 witnesses come there and embarrass themselves? Will they withstand the withering set of questions from six former members of Congress? Uh, uh, and what will happen? It was a dramatic week. Over the course of the week, these six former members of Congress certainly got engaged uh, in the issue. There's what the ballroom uh, looked like. I couldn't find the color photo of this in the last few days, but you'll see there's me acting as moderator. Then the six former members of Congress, Carolyn Kilpatrick is here, Merrill Cook's chairing that day, so it was Friday. And there's Danny Sheehan, and then the witness table was set here. It was streamed live, um, no expense spared on the setting. Um, Congresswoman Hooley uh, had to leave at noon on Friday. Her sister had died right before the event began, and she came anyway, but she left a little early on Friday. And very generously, the other members of Congress allowed me to fill in for her. So there are actually seven of us who got to ask questions of witnesses. Uh, mine was limited just to the last half of the last day. Uh, after it was over, I began typing a transcript of the entire 30 hours. I want to produce a congressional record-like version, a printed version, kind of 
just for fun, my contribution to history if you want, whatever, footnoted, annotated, spell checked, whatever. And as I was going through that, by the time I got to the 29th of July, so um, May, June, July, so three months later, I had noticed that Dr. Greer had made this statement. Uh, Admiral Moran, who won the Empire Prize, it sounded like Empire Prize in France, and is an MD as am I, and also a PhD physicist, and was an advisor to President Sarkozy, wow, what a guy, uh, has been meeting with us. I thought, that's interesting. So I go Googling for Moran, and I couldn't find him. So I send him this email and say, hey, can you confirm the spelling? And uh, he wrote me back and said, oh, yeah, it's the Ampere Prize, not Empire. And I believe it's uh, Admiral Moran with an I, but I'll check my files. And then he's never gotten back to me. Every six months or so, I say, hey, Dr. Greer, have you checked your files? Hey, Dr. Greer, hello, still working on the transcript. Dr. Greer, here's everything you had to say. Do you want to revise and extend your remarks? And I've done that with many of the witnesses. Nick Pope, for example, went through and changed a few things. Uh, and nothing, just silence. So um, I've added this footnote. Um, no information has yet been found to verify an Admiral Moran, PhD, MD, praise and peer recipient. It appears Dr. Greer has conflated. There was this group that sent a letter to President Sarkozy about UFOs, and that's the closest I can come, but none of them uh, won the Ampere Prize. But they kind of fit the MD, PhD, physicist, whatever model, so I sent that off to Dr. Greer. Here's what I think you did. Is it possible you had a memory issue? You conflated something? You're the Brian Williams of... Uh, too old a joke now, Brian Williams conflating, oh, never mind, uh, and uh, nothing. Well, I got one reply from the Exopolitics Institute, which Sila runs, Michael Sila, saying, well, there is this Marin. Well, he didn't win the Ampere Prize, and he's not an admiral, and he didn't advise President Sarkozy, but he speaks French, and he talked about UFOs. Maybe he just got confused. And I said, well, that's ridiculous. This was testimony given under oath. I know I had the role of administering the oath. It was testimony given with weeks of preparation. The witnesses were asked to submit their testimonies in writing ahead of time. This wasn't a simple, oh, I got my names confused thing. And if it was, why not just tell me? Uh, so, uh, and he's never met with Dr. Greer. So, uh, and Greer made the statement twice then. I got into transcribing the evening sessions just in the last year or so. And, he's, and Dr. Greer said at an evening session, not under oath, Ultimately, I wound up meeting with so many people. Gordon Cooper, Admiral Moran of the French government, who I mentioned earlier today, the list goes on, and hundreds and hundreds of these sort of senior officials. Okay, really? Um, so um, I got a lot of blowback from my little footnote saying I think Dr. Greer goofed here. There are loyal, almost religious-like followers of this individual who think I'm part of the government cover-up and that uh, Cooper, Colonel Alexander Hiller uh, murdered uh, Dr. Greer's assistant, right? That's the accusation this guy can throw out recklessly in writing. So uh, I wrote back and said, Dr. Greer is apparently free to accuse another researcher of being a multiple murderer and of attempted murder with impunity. Any attempt to verify statements made by Dr. Greer, at least in my experience, are categorized as attacks on the love and light he represents. Can I call this the other bullshit that it is? There's clearly no Moran, no uh, recipient of the prize Ampere. It was a simple misstatement of fact. I'd correct it. Perhaps he misremembered, but I've given him the opportunity, and he hasn't. So I'm a little short on time. I'll go quickly. Really interestingly, after these hearings, uh, John Podesta sent out this tweet last year. He had been working with the Obama administration and then uh, tweeted out after he was uh, finished, finally, my biggest failure of 2014, once again not seeing the disclosure of the UFO files. I think it's absolutely extraordinary that the current chairman of the Hillary Clinton for President campaign would put out that kind of a tweet. Uh, we've, a little bit of news coverage has happened after, these, uh, after the citizens' hearings. Steve Bassett would say that's because of the hearings and the ground it opened. I think that has some credibility to it. Uh, in 1995, Hillary Clinton did meet with Lawrence Rockefeller, a billionaire. They were engaging the ET issue, the pest of a billionaire, Bassett said, no coverage. I can make the case that we'll have disclosure before the New Hampshire primaries in that December article. There's Hillary with the book about extraterrestrials, which you may have seen. If not, check out the Rockefeller Initiative uh, discussion you find on the internet. And I got quoted in the article. Even Bassett's closest supporters expressed doubt about how close we are to the truth. Quote, he's one of the most overly optimistic people I've ever met, said Joseph Bookman, a fellow true believer. 
So how am I both a true believer and calling him overly optimistic in the same sentence? I find it endearing, but I don't know if it's quite as close to happening as he thinks it is. I still feel that way about Steve. I talked to Steve just a couple of days ago. He has no problem with my saying this kind of stuff. He says, if you're going to be a lobbyist, you've got to be overly optimistic. The SETI Institute uh, does a, is that my time or do I have a minute left? Give me one more minute and then I'll go to questions. SETI runs a, con a biannual conference called Contact Cultures of the Imagination. Uh, I presented there two years ago. That's Seth Shostak and I. He does have a sense of humor about this issue. There's uh, Frank Drake and Bill Baruki of Kepler. Incredible people. Uh, they attended that presentation, listened to it politely. These are people who are interested in this. They find virtually all of what's out there not credible. Uh, Burning Man was mentioned earlier with the Dean Radin random number stuff presented there. They did put the man on top of a flying saucer a couple of years ago. I'll skip over the New York Times thing. That was Collier's with Dr. Seuss's Prayer for a Child, which is kind of cool. But there's my email. If you have any suggestions about how to improve the congressional record-like transcript I'm creating of this 30 hours of testimony of the citizens hearing, I'd love for you to write me, and I'll do questions now. Thank you for disclosing the political side of UFOs. And we have questions. When I uh, consider what I'm aware of, of, of the UFO disclosure and alleged cover-up and so forth, I find that I keep returning to the thought that if, if the United States government does not in fact have any U UFO files because they are not now and never have been in contact with extraterrestrials and do not now and have not ever had any uh, evidence that their investigators considered credible about extraterrestrial spacecraft, uh, there is nothing they could possibly do to persuade the UFO community otherwise. And I have to confess to a suspicion that all of the leaked documents that have been referred to are actually a disinformation campaign by the government to try to get these excited hobbyists chasing a non-existent figment rather than possibly uncovering real secret projects. I wonder if you would like to comment on this. Um, you know, as a tyranny-hating, libertarian-leaning, uh, um, you know, uh, cynic regarding uh, our, our government, which is, by the way, largely not only dysfunctional and wasteful, but I think even evil in the same sense that Ronald Reagan called the Soviet Union evil. You know, that's part projection. We're not that different in a lot of respects. I'm sure our government engages in disinformation. All of them do. Uh, their purpose is largely to get reelected and increase power, and to the degree that shutting out disinformation uh, assists with that, I'm sure they do it. Um, that said, uh, Gordon Cooper, you know, last American to orbit the Earth alone on Faith 7, uh, in his book A Leap of Faith, talks about what he witnessed at Edwards. So, how do you have an American hero of Gordon Cooper's credibility talk about a lenticular shaped craft? you know, being filmed with missile tests, or about the Foo Fighters that he witnessed during uh, World War II. What was, what was that about? Um, there are um, a handful uh, of very interesting, very credible cases that I'd suggest you look at. Uh, and a good place to start is Colonel Alexander's book, the first sentence of which is, UFOs are real. And then if I recall, the next paragraph is something like, we have high credible military witnesses with radar returns and gun camera film in multiple nations that show non-human created technology in our skies. And then the last of John's book, which I'll continue to promote, is that that ET hypothesis of biological life in a souped up Corvette getting here somehow isn't sufficient to cover all the data. There's more going on. It's transdimensional. It's, and I'll let Colonel Alexander take over from there. <laughs> Well, well, let me finish the last paragraph, uh, because basically it says, in, yeah, A, it starts out whatever, you know, UFOs are real at some level, and whatever this is, it is more complex than anything we have imagined or possibly could imagine. 
uh, which was not what I wanted to talk about. I, I, what I wanted to just mention is congressional hearings, because I think there's a huge misconception on what we're talking about. Uh, this was five days, obviously not congressmen and all that. I had, uh, when I was getting ready for a presentation, I, I picked a day in which Congress was in session and looked at the number, and there were 17 hearings that day. If you got five hours, let alone five days, uh, that would be a lot, and absolutely nothing came out of any of them. So this idea that you're going to have these mystical hearings and the world's going to change is just not reality. Well, you sound like Senator Gravel. Uh, you should go back and look at what he said, which is calling for Congress to investigate this isn't worth a bucket of spit. Yeah. Well, um, I talked to Mike right after the, they had done that, too. Right. I mean, and Gravel was on fire during the hearings. If you, if you haven't watched the citizens' hearing, you know, some of it is, uh, is just incredible um, television. And I, I do look for it. I do hope they manage to edit it down into some kind of 90-minute to two-hour documentary. All that's on hold. They ran out of money. They're all uh, unclear on who's got the rights or where they're going to go next with the theatrical version. Yes, sir. Well, I, I got a, a comment. It's not, not so much a question, but uh, it's interesting you bring up politics, the politics dimension of this. And there are some people may, might remember that there have been actual congressional hearings that have been done on this going back to 1968. 1967, I think. 67, 68. Yeah, it was the last uh, last hearings, and it was and, just a day. And Stanton Friedman. From he submitted state. testimony in writing, but he wasn't there in person, if so, I recall. And uh, I, it'd be interesting I, to see some of the te the recorded testimony of the congressmen that were qu doing the questioning. I think. Well, you can right find, there. and I purchased on eBay the uh, uh, government printing office uh, uh, record of those hearings. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think it was 67. That's what I'm using as a model for the work I'm doing on this. And I, I believe that sprung in part out of uh, Project Blue Book, uh -huh. uh, some sightings in Michigan. and Well, Gerald Ford, Gerald uh, Ford, as a representative from Michigan, was calling for congressional hearings. Right. And then he meant, never mentioned the word UFO or aliens or ETs once he was president. Shut up about it. Hey, Joe. Well, I just want to thank you for putting on a great event there. Uh, I was there for it, and I thought it was just the most amazing thing. Uh, you know, Bob Wood was there, who was here at the conference. Right. Remember, he testified to us that as a McDonnell Douglas career employee, they, they were always attempting to find the propulsion systems. If you think this is a figment of someone's imagination, McDonnell Douglas spent a lot of time and energy trying to find out if they could reverse engineer the propulsion systems of UFOs, and they never figured it out. That doesn't mean someone hasn't figured it out, but they did. But, you know, what I'm wondering is, what's it going to take for our media to take this more seriously? I sat in the media section, and I talked to the New York Times photographer. He said to us, this is the best material I've ever seen. I can't get them to send anyone down from New York to cover it. And then the two Washington Post reporters concluded that belief in UFOs was a schizotypal mental disorder. Yeah, and they put the pictures of the people wearing crystals on the front of the New York Times. They were just there as observers. So why are they, you know, with the quality of the witnesses, what's, what's wrong with them that they can't even cover it? In a, you know, a other countries do, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, a, I don't know. The conspiratorialists will tell you it's a vast uh, right and left wing combined conspiracy. To stop it, to go back to your first question, I would, I would say also, if they have some evidence, and I, I do suspect they do. I suspect there's gun camera footage. I, I think the film that, uh, that Gordon Cooper talks about that he says he shipped back to D.C. that never showed up in the Blue Book reports or any of that, that some of this stuff is in a vault somewhere or whatnot. I, I believe that. Um, I think there's credible evidence of that. I think one of the, the reasons they may not disclose that is it just opens a can of worms of stuff they don't know anything about. I don't, I'm sure they don't have all the answers. I'm sure that if we were to have the president come out and say, hey, extraterrestrial craft is here, some of these witnesses are fully credible, here's the evidence we have, it's going to open a trillion questions that we don't have the answers to and be even worse. We think we don't know what we want to know now, but once that occurs, it's going to be like that times 10,000. On the other hand, I'd hope if humanity gets to a place where we know we're not alone in the universe, that there is life out there that's curious and relatively benign to benevolent that's here, maybe we'd become humans on Earth and stop fighting over our geographic territorial issues or resources and, and unite in a way that would be a good thing. So I'd kind of like to see that day come anyway. But it's probably a mess when it does. Thank you very much.